Yeah. Good. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, we got Dr. Valianovsky here. He's going to just talk about some of the uh, COPD trials that are going on within the department uh, before Dr. Nadim's lecture about ARDS. We don't have to have the video. Look at my beautiful hair. Where did the other one go? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Ready? Yep. Awesome. So just page that. Okay, perfect. Hi, everyone. Um, so we were uh, we were asked, Dr. Ouellette and I were asked to uh, give a brief talk uh, and chat about a couple of the re COPD research studies that are ongoing right now in the department. And so uh, there's two studies, Reliance and Dipolumab, and I'll briefly go over the two of them. I won't take too much time from Oasis lecture. Thanks Oasis for, for allowing us to, to do this as well. So the first study is Reliance and Reliance is a comparative effectiveness research trial. And so it's, it's a little different than your typical um, medication versus placebo trial. It's actually comparing two medications head to head when there's an indication that's similar for the two of them. And so this really started from PCORI, which was, um, strongly funded by the Obama administration to answer these real-life real um, questions. And they started an initiative, which was the Pragmatic Clinical Studies Initiative in 2014. And so specifically in this trial, we're trying to answer, you know, patients are optimized on triple therapy. They've had um, admissions, and you're uh, trying to decide what's the next step. Do we go to reflumolase or do we go to azithromycin? Is one better than the other? So Reliance is a US-based multi-center randomized 36-month parallel group non-inferiority phase three study to compare the effectiveness of reflumolase versus azithromycin using comparative effectiveness research methodology. The dosing really is flexible. You, it, it, ultimately, it's whatever you end up uh, providing from a prescription standpoint, but it can be 500 micrograms for Rohumoras um, or alternative or 250 milligrams of azithromycin either taken daily or 500 three times a week, but you'll notice it's or alternative regimen. So uh, patient participation really is just the phone survey. So if you're open to a randomization between the two medications to eliminate that bias, the uh, participation is they get a call at the one week mark, the three month mark, the six month mark, and then every six months. And that's, it's just the phone survey. So that's the whole point of comparative effectiveness research. You're comparing real life outcomes. So medication A versus medication B in a real life environment. So these are, you might've uh, received some emails from Sherry or Lowell or Jackie. And we've been screening not only for Reliance, but now also for Dupi at the same time. We're not telling you that you have to enroll these patients. We're just saying, hey, they meet A, B, C, and D, any of the criteria that are in red. So if we have a COPD patient, a history of severe COPD, they're at least 40, 10 pack year smoking history. And specifically for Reliance, they've been hospitalized with an exacerbation in the last year. That's all that it takes to um, from an inclusion criteria standpoint. We then email you, let you know that this patient may be a candidate. It's up to you to let us know if you wanna um, escalate care to either one of these medications. And again, you have to be open to uh, randomizing these patients as well. The patient does have to provide a contact telephone number too because the follow-up is by telephone. They could also do it through um, online to answer all the questions, but typically they just follow up through a telephone survey. The exclusion criteria, there's really not that many of them if you think about it. Um, the patient has to be able to provide informed consent. 
if they do have an intolerance of either medication, um, if they are currently treated with either of the medications, that's an exclusion criteria. If they were on it in the past, it's actually not an exclusion criteria, so you can restart them. If they have a hypersensitivity to macrolide or ketolide, um, known, we essentially eliminate patients during screening. I actually look at their liver enzymes. They have any um, history of liver disease, elevated liver enzymes, or um, in addition, a QTC of 500 or greater, we actually don't even email you uh, up front, or we shouldn't. In addition, a current pregnancy is also a uh, criteria to eliminate patients or exclude patients. So our goal is uh, one to two patients a month. Our first patient was enrolled in March. Um, we've actually, we just enrolled our sixth patient. Um, one withdrew due to GI side effects. We were the 13th best recruiting site. I'm not sure if that goes up a little bit because we've just enrolled our sixth patient. We also have two that are on our satellite. Um, so the study overall has randomized or enrolled patients predominantly from an outpatient setting. We've actually, um, and that's 87% of the patients in the study. Here at Henry Ford, we've enrolled 67% uh, of the patients on the outpatient side and the other third um, on the inpatient side. Any questions about uh, reliance specifically? So it's a comparative effectiveness research study. There really isn't much or many exclusion criteria. If a patient is optimized on triple therapy and you're looking at what to do next and you're considering azithromycin versus perfumalase, then I would likely consider this, this study. Discuss it with your staff. You do not do it. Yeah, you don't have to do, uh, do the actual informed consent. So the next step would be to let one of our research coordinators know. Um, it could be Jackie, Rowell. You could also discuss it with Dr. Ouellette, myself, um, as well as Bethany Adams. And you just let them know. They provide the informed consent to the patient. Often what happens is the patient takes it home, considers it, and then we do a follow-up call and then um, initiate the medication. At home. We also look to see if the medication is covered by insurance too. Um, and so we often may tell you that beforehand as well. Good question. And again, the exacerbation has to be a hospitalization for reliance. It can't be an urgent care center, an ED visit. It actually has to be a hospitalization, which is different than DUPI. So the Pulumab is the next study that we're going to discuss. And this, the Pulumab is a monoclonal antibody that inhibits interleukin-4 and 13 signaling and type 2 inflammation. So it's currently indicated in uncontrolled moderate to severe atopic dermatitis, moderate to severe asthma with an eosinophilic uh, phenotype or oral corticosteroid dependent asthma, as well as inadequately controlled chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyposis. So DUPI, Dupexin, Dupolumab, you might hear it referred, any of those names. It's a randomized double blind placebo controlled parallel group 52 week pivotal mm -hmm. study to assess the efficacy safety and tolerability of dupolumab in patients with moderate to severe COPD with type two inflammation. So it's a uh, sub-Q injection, whether it's a placebo or dupi, it's taken every two weeks. A uh, question that's often asked is, uh, can the patients administer it themselves? They can after we witness them doing it on their own. Um, our dermatology department uses it often for atopic dermatitis and they say it's pretty easy to administer as well. The primary endpoint is analyzed rate of moderate to severe COPD exacerbation. So the inclusion criteria is patients age 40 to 80, similar to uh, Reliance, 10 pack year smoking history, again, similar. They have to be on triple therapy for at least three months unless an inhaled corticosteroid is contraindicated. They have to be obstructed and with an FEV1 to FEC between 30 to 70%. Um, they also have to suffer from chronic bronchitis. And they, uh, for COPD exacerbation, they either have to have one severe or two moderate. A severe is either a hospitalization, an ED visit or urgent care visit longer than 24 hours. So this is different than reliance um, as well, or 
um, two moderate exacerbations. So if you have a patient that calls twice and asks for, uh, I think it's a COPD sick note, um, two courses of steroids, they would actually qualify for the study as well. Or one course of steroids and another course of antibiotics on a different visit, that would also qualify the patient for this study. Now, during the screening visit, we see if they have a, an absolute eosinophil count of at least 300. That's the threshold that Gold recommends for treatment of uh, if a likely response to steroids as well in, in COPD patients who suffer from type 2 inflammation. So uh, key exclusion criteria. The first is probably the most difficult, and we've come across it a couple of times. Patients who suffer from asthma or have a documented history where they've been treated for asthma. So this is where documentation actually kills you in the sense if you have an emergency medicine visit, patient has asthma or a primary care physician is probably a better example. They, they document asthma, treat the patient or actually eliminate this patient. Um, most likely eliminate the patient. Other significant pulmonary disease, uh, Dr. Ouellette and myself would, would determine if um, that would uh, exclude them from the study. If they suffer from core pulmonary, right-sided heart failure, they're using supplemental oxygen greater than 12 hours, MI or stroke within the last six months, heart failure, class three, class four, uh, and paroxysmal AFib as well. There's other exclusion criteria. Those are the main ones. Uh, what you would do if you're considering a patient, let the study coordinators know again, and they would um, do a thorough evaluation. We've um, just screened a patient there was a, it, it was considered a screen failure because between our screening visit and randomization, they had a, an exacerbation. We also have another patient that we will be screening shortly as well. And a couple others on our end. On our. It's a 52 week trial. So the screening visit anywhere from uh, one to four weeks after the screening visit is when the randomization and initiation of the trial occurs. At 52 weeks, there's a 12 week post-treatment follow-up period as well. So it's on the Palm website. Um, if you just put in Depolimab, it'll come up. If you put in Reliance, there's also information there too. If you're considering a patient in clinic, what I would advise is just go to the site. Um, there's some simple inclusion and exclusion criteria for each study, kind of help guide you along the way. And then uh, let one of the research coordinators know, let Dr. Ouellette know, let, let myself know, and we'll do our best to see if, if they uh, qualify for the study. Um, you can contact anyone on the study team. Sohaib is one of the fellows that has been helping out as well. Amber, Nisha, um, Sally Askar, as well as Alayan, uh, our residents that have helped out. And then I think you guys know the research coordinators. If you don't, those are the names of the three of them. Any questions? All right. Well, thanks so much for your time. You guys have a wonderful day. All right. <clears throat> Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, I think everybody here knows me, but someone online. Uh, my name is Oasis Nadim, and today I'll talk to you about the ARDS. Um, Obviously, with the recent COVID and the expert training you're getting in ARDS uh, in general, um, you probably know most of the information here, but I'll try to cover a lot of trials and actual evidence behind the practice that you do. Um, and you know, if any questions come up, just let me know. Now, this is not going to be a journal club style of each trial that we go through. That would take hours, uh, if not days. Uh, but we'll still try to cover as much as possible. <clears throat> so start, uh, surprise, no disclosures here. All right, so let's get started. The first time um, ARDS was mentioned in literature uh, was this case series in 1967 uh, by Ashbaugh and colleagues. Um, they first saw uh, 12 patients, this was a 12 patient case series, 
and they were running through a trend of patients. These patients were short of breath, uh, they were tachypnic, they were cyanotic, um, they were uh, they had bilateral infiltrates. And one of the interesting th interesting things they talked about <clears throat> on a later article was when they went back and looked at these patients, um, they they had to go find a ventilator and learn how to re start it up. And then when they connected these patients to PEEP, they noticed that these patients uh, who were cyanotic and blue would turn pink. And when they took PEEP off, they would go back to being blue again. And this was an interesting finding. So they actually submitted this paper <clears throat> to the England Journal of Medicine and it was rejected. Um, they, said, <laughs> they said that it was um, uh, their scaling criticism, PEEP causes cardiac output failure and decreases cardiac output. This is a bad idea. You probably shouldn't be doing this. They sent this to American Medical Association, and the main author is actually a surgeon. They sent it to a journal of surgery. All of them rejected it. Uh, they then sent it to Lancet, and they said this was such a significant finding that this would be the lead paper. But that was actually the case. Um, so that was how it all started. <clears throat> we then go into the, so that was 1967, 70s and 80s. We're looking at a lot of interesting respiratory failure. People are calling it congestive atelectasis, post-traumatic um, uh, pulmonary insufficiency, shock lung, all these different names, which are likely ARDS that were being treated. Um, in 1988, Murray and colleagues tried to define ARDS until in 1994, we had the first uh, uh, American European consensus conference and they tried to define ARDS. Don't try to memorize this because it's not what you should be. Uh, the updated one. So this is acute lung injury and ARDS. So you'll see a lot of studies that had descriptions of ALI and ARDS, uh, where they looked at timing, acute onset. Uh, they had oxygenation defined, but it was odd, less than 300 ALI, less than 200 ARDS. So does that mean acute lung injury is just, you know, uh, 200 to 300? That's kind of unclear. Uh, chest x-ray with bilateral infiltrates, and then uh, pulmonary artery wedge pressures back when we used to put in pulmonary artery catheters, you had to have a wedge pressure less than 18. <clears throat> so now we'll kind of talk about all the things that kind of made some of the things here uh, not as clear. Um, <clears throat> this was an interesting study um, uh, by Rubenfeld and colleagues in Chess Medicine in 1999. Uh, they took 21 experts um, in, from the Canadian uh, Mechanical Vent Workshop and the NIH ARDS Network uh, physicians, pulmonologists who are good at reading x-rays, and they basically asked them, hey, look at these x-rays and tell me, do you think this is ARDS or not? And they showed them 28 x-rays, and these were some of the findings. There's a lot of more of them, but, you know, first one, they're like, oh, bilateral infiltrate, that one had 100% agreement. The second one, 80% agreement that that's not ARDS, <clears throat> and the last one's all over the place, so 52%. In this um, study, they actually uh, had a variability from 36% to 71%. Just to point out the fact that it's not easy to just agree on who's ARDS, okay? Um, the other thing to talk about is uh, use of pulmonary artery catheters. So we'll go back, we'll talk about fact trial later on about how it was used um, for fluid management. But one of the things they also looked at was management using a pulmonary artery catheter versus a central line. <clears throat> so you look at CVPs. Um, there's, you can do a whole separate lecture on all the different ways pulmonary artery catheters have not shown evidence to be supportive in uh, clinical care in certain, in every specific diagnosis. We're talking heart failure and shock and ARDS and ALI. So this was sp uh, specifically an acute lung injury. <clears throat> and what they found was exactly that. There was no uh, mortality benefit in patients when they use a pulmonary artery catheter versus using a central line for CVP measurements. Um, which is why there's no difference in those lines. Um, this was 1,000 patients um, in 20 North American centers. Um, this, whoops, uh, 20 North American centers and uh, population of just acute lung injury randomized within four hours. And one of the other things they did notice was there was significantly more complications in the PA catheter uh, group, specifically in arrhythmias. Uh, something also that's interesting, so these are graphs of uh, the actual wedge pressures of the patients and the actual CVPs. And when you look at this, so we talked about that cutoff of 18, correct? So look at how many patients with diagnosed ALI and ARDS are wedge pressures greater than 18. So 29% of patients had wedge pressures greater than 18. And when you looked at those patients with high wedge pressures, 
97% of them had normal cardiac output and index. So that tells you, I guess, ARDS patients can also have high wedge pressures. Um, and if you want to use CVPs in central line, look how many patients have high central uh, penis pressures. So is it really all that useful? <clears throat> So coming back to the limitations of this initial um, uh, guideline, you have unclear uh, focus on how, what is acute onset. Um, you can, it's kind of unclear from P to F, you know, what is between 200 to 300. I already talked about bilateral infiltrates and chest x-ray and then wedge pressures, are they useful or not? So those are some of the limitations. So then in 2012, um, there are European Society of Intensive Care Medicine with support from uh, SCCM and NTS developed the Berlin definition in 2012. This you should have memorized. Um, this one clarified the timing. So it's acute onset within one week. Um, bilateral infiltrates that are not explained by bilateral, um, effusions, low bar lung collapse, nodules, uh, and then origin of edema. All you have to know is you don't think that the primary reason this patient has bilateral infiltrates is due to heart failure. Okay, so you use your clinical judgment. <clears throat> and then the oxygenation, this time a little more clear definition of P to F. Okay, so again, remember, it didn't talk about which patients were on PEEP and which weren't. This one specifically talks about PEEP or CPAP greater than five and then moderate and severe. Obviously, there are intubated patients who are requiring uh, PEEP, at least five. Um, the other important aspect of all this was you, you actually see better predictive validity of mortality and outcomes in these patients. So you can see the mild, moderate to severe, the mortality actually goes up based on severity, right? So 27, 32, 45, and three days is significantly reduced. And you see the duration of mechanical ventilation also goes up. So it's a better predictive model. So let's talk about the pathophysiology. So you may have seen this slide many times. Um, I'll try to cover a little bit because I think people skip over pathophys quickly. And when I heard this, this lecture for the first time, it kind of does stick in your head of why this is happening. Um, let's just quickly talk about the normal side. Now people don't, uh, this is more from medical school, type one pneumocytes, type two pneumocytes. You guys know which one does what? So a quick review, <laughs> go ahead. Uh-huh. Correct, so the type one pneumocyte lines up 95% of the alveoli. It helps in gas exchange. It gets injured very easily. Type two pneumocytes are your cuboidal ones, small, they release surfactant, but the interesting thing it also does, it can proliferate into a type one pneumocyte and injury. Mm -hmm. um, so in this particular case, when you have uh, in ARDS, you have damage to the membranes. Uh, you form these hyaline membranes. What's hyaline membranes? Essentially dead debris of cells that forms these membranes worsens gas exchange. You have all these um, inflammatory cells come in, neutrophils, macrophages, fibroblasts come in, damages the epithelial wall, uh, damages the blood vessels itself. And all these things cause interstitial edema. Again, worsening gas exchange. <clears throat> so I am not a pathologist and you don't have to be a pathologist either just to look at these three slides. So the first one's a normal lung. Um, the second image is a biopsy of a patient two days after they aspirated a gastric, uh, massive amount of uh, gastric aspiration, okay? The third image is lung biopsy specimen of somebody who's 14 days into sepsis, okay? So you sig see significant amount of hyaline membranes. You see a lot mm -hmm. of inflammatory debris in those uh, alveoli, right? So underlying causes. So this actual image is from a study back in 2000. And just to demonstrate that this still holds true, if you look at all the studies from the last two years, you'll still notice the three more, most common causes are pneumonia, non-pulmonary sepsis, um, and aspiration, okay? So this still holds true. The other causes are still present. All right, so treatment. So let's talk about, this is where we'll get through all, um, you know, you treat the underlying cause and you support the lungs, okay? And that's all I have. It's not. Um, so now let's talk about this trials a little bit. Um, this study was specifically done in acute hypoxic respiratory failure patients. This is not diagnosed ARDS, but this was an interesting study to look at patients who are on non breathers versus heated high flow versus um, non-invasive ventilation. And their criteria fits ARDS if they were then intubated. So this may be 
you know, uh, most of the patients would fit the criteria into ARDS if they then worsen and get intubated. Um, so this was a multi-centered randomized controlled trial, 300 patients. They were looking at P to F less than 300. In the non-rebreather group, it was more than 10 liters. Um, and then in the heated high flow, it was 50 liters, 100%. They would titrate down based on oxygen requirements. And the third group was non-invasive ventilation, which they used at eight-hour sessions for two, two days, okay? Uh, it was also uh, pressure support with targeted uh, tidal volume, seven to 10 cc's per pig of ideal body weight. They used peak between two to 10 to keep oxygenation. But those were the three groups. And um, in the first group, you actually see, uh, we'll get to the results. The primary outcome was intubation at day 28. And while not statistically significant um, between the three groups, there was definitely a trend towards benefit of heated high flow. Um, and then when you actually did a, did a post hoc analysis on these patients, and when you actually look at P to F less than 200, um, there was a benefit for heated eye flow. It was statistically <laughs> significant. Mortality in 90 days was statistically significant with difference in, uh, you know, 13% versus 22 and 31. Uh, this was 23 ICUs in France and Belgium and um, randomization within 60, uh, 60 minutes of diagnosis of acute hypoxic respiratory failure. All uh, right. So let's talk about the ventilator now, but before we talk about the ventilator, let's talk about how all the ways we hurt patients with ventilators. So ventilator induced lung injury. Um, first two, there, there's gonna be three or four definitions I want you to know. First one being volume trauma and barotrauma. So volume trauma is from the high tidal volumes, um, whereas barotrauma is lung injury induced by high pressures. And clinically, these are both the same as transpulmonary pressure goes up, your volume goes up. So uh, clinically, there wouldn't be a difference between them. And the best uh, image to demonstrate this is, this is one of my favorites. Um, so this was a study done in uh, macroscopic view of rats where they put uh, peak pressures at 45 and tried to see what it looks like at five minutes after and 20 minutes after. So that's normal lungs, five mm -hmm. minutes and 20 minutes. Okay. So, uh, so when your patient's sitting with peak pressures of 45, think of this image. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. This is the microscopic view. Uh, the first one's five minutes into those peak pressures and the next one's 20 minutes after. You can see the destruction of the epithelial membranes and all the inflammatory infiltrates that come in. Um, and you can, you can see the interstitial edema that comes in once you damage those walls. <clears throat> All right, next we'll talk about biotrauma. That's just from the increased stress and strain causing the damage in the barriers. You then have all the inflammatory infiltrates come in. I won't get too much into it because that's essentially what we talked about earlier, right? That's the biotrauma. And then lastly, at electrotrauma. So at electrotrauma is the shear strain on the alveoli from the constant opening and closing. And, you know, I, I think this really demonstrates it well, where you look at your uh, pressure volume curves, just like a balloon, when you put air into it, it requires a little bit extra pressure till it eases in, you're able to inflate it. That's your lower inflection point where you start to get alveolar recruitment. Before that, you're running into at electrotrauma. Once you get to your upper inflection point where any more air won't get you a significant, any more pressure does not give you any significant increase in volume till it gives you a pneumothorax, that's your upper inflection point. And that's why you worry about barotrauma and volutrauma, okay? All right, so now we'll start talking about the actual trials. And the first and most famous uh, is the <laughs> ARMA trial, ones in tidal volumes. Uh, so multi-centered randomized control trial, 860 patients, where they actually looked at six cc's per kg versus 12 cc's per kg. Uh, reading back at some of the literature, they said some people were actually on, you know, not in this trial, but earlier were on 20 cc's per kg, which um, that would be impressive. Um, in these patients, they saw a significant reduction in mortality. <clears throat> so uh, when we talk about tidal volumes, going down on tidal volumes concerns is usually about what? Right, so ventilation, you worry about, oh, what is pH gonna do, CO2 gonna do? So we often talk about, uh, well, we'll do permissive hypercapnia. What do, you, what do you guys normally practice where below this pH, I'm not really comfortable? Yep, so that was actually in the trial that it was pH of 7.15. So you hear that, you know, at least in practice, that's what they use in the trials too. Um, 
they used the lowest tidal volume of four cc's per keg. They wouldn't go below mm -hmm. that. And the pH of 7.15, they wouldn't go below that. Um, but be mindful, they did use bicarbon fusions whenever they needed to, to maintain a good pH. So despite the low tidal volumes, they actually had really good pH. That was because they tried to correct it as much as possible. <clears throat> the trial was actually stopped early because of the significant benefit. Um, vent free days was, were also significantly uh, reduced. And the interesting part is, and I'm going to talk about this again later, uh, in 2016, they did a study internationally. It's, it's quite an impressive study, and we'll talk about this after the lung safe study. They looked at that and to see what is the actual management out there in clinical practice. And two thirds of patients um, are being managed at less than eight cc's per kg. And 60% of people, 16 years later, later after this trial, are 60% uh, of patients are still more than seven cc's per kg. So there's some room for improvement here, right? Um, all right. Uh, the P to F in this uh, group was just to know the severity of the disease was uh, average uh, 136. So next we'll talk about PEEP. And the three main PEEP trials that you will you should know about are alveoli, lung open ventilation strategy, and express. Um, they all compared to the low PEEP strategy, which is at the top. There's the high PEEP uh, from alveoli, high PEEP from lung open ventilation, and then express. The main difference being, uh, so let's just look at 0.5, for example, and where the PEEP stands for all of them, okay? So 10 versus 16 versus um, 14 to 18. So actually, the last two trials had to have a pre-protocol change and post. You guys know why? Basically, physicians that were being told to do these protocols weren't comfortable. So first, they had to slightly keep lower peeps and say, hey, try this out. And when they felt more comfortable, they went up on the peep further. Um, the average peep in the alveolar trial was 8 to 13, whereas in the lung open ventilation was 9 to 14. And you can see where they were just really pushing it on express um, at 8 to 15. And in the express trial, they actually said, use peep as high as possible but don't go over plateau pressures of 30. And um, uh, for, for uh, protecting against barotrauma. Um, so the different, there was no significant difference in alveoli, lung open ventilation strategy and express, both of them had a significant trend towards benefit, but it wasn't statistically significant when it came to mortality. But it did show statistical significance in lung function and hypoxemia. So you were oxygenating significantly better. Okay. We then go into the meta-analysis of these uh, studies. So actually the three main trials are driving this meta-analysis and you see the force plots, Brower, Mead and Merkett are the three studies that we just talked about. And when it comes to mortality, there's a trend towards benefit, but it's overlapping ones so wasn't statistical significance, but in hypoxemia, you can see the significant benefit of it. And when we go then to this driving pressure, so someone actually, uh, Amato et al. Uh, group actually went back at the nine randomized controlled trials and tried to uh, do an analysis of these studies. They looked at patients that when they maintained a PEEP and at, if for the same PEEP, your plateau pressures were rising, your mortality rate actually goes up. For the, if the PEEP is rising and the plateau pressure rises at the same time, so your driving pressure, which is plateau minus PEEP, does not change, your mortality doesn't change. And then looking at your uh, last group, if going up on PEEP does not increase your plateau pressure, essentially your um, driving pressure is reduced, your mortality actually goes down. So it kind of explains this whole idea, well, you don't just keep going up on PEEP, there's more to it. How does that affect your peak pressures? How does that affect your plateau pressures? Um, and are you recruiting or are you causing barotrauma? And you don't know this until you, at, you see what your where your patient stands, right? <clears throat> um, this was actually uh, from the same study. They just, just showing the same thing, change in driving pressure, um, looking at uh, death uh, in the hospital. And as you increase the uh, driving pressure, the mortality goes up. That lung safe study I mentioned earlier, in this uh, study, they actually found a cutoff that if you start going driving pressure above 14, mortality actually goes up, okay? 
All right. So let's talk about stress index. This often, uh, it's often brought up. Uh, just so you know, by the way, the study was done on 15 patients, uh, 2007. Um, first, they actually tested this in rats, and then they did this in um, uh, pigs. And what they did was they would um, in increase the peak pressure based on the pressure volume curve, okay? Um, uh, pressure time curve, sorry. And that does that indicate elastins? And the way they looked at that was they would then CT scan these uh, animals and see if there was more aeration or less based on Hounsfeld units. Um, they then did this trial, which was a, um, uh, they would look at the slope of this curve, the pressure time curve. And if it was one, that means the elastins is not changing with increased peak. Um, if it was less than one, that means there is uh, decreased elastins, um, elevated, uh, there's decreased elastins and there's room for peep to go up. And then at the very end, you would, um, if the stress index is greater than one, elastins is actually increasing, okay? Just to think again about, are you recruiting? Or are you causing more barotrauma, okay? Um, in this study, just so you know, they shut off auto flow, so it's constant flow. These patients were paralyzed, okay? So they used vecuronium and Versed. It was kind of unclear, did they use train of force or were the patient properly paralyzed or not? But we'll get into that. Um, PEEP differences in this study were, um, th this specific study looked at using um, st uh, stress index PEEP versus um, ARDSnet PEEP, okay? And they wanted to maintain the PEEP difference between ARDSnet and stress index was 6.8 versus 13.2. So by using stress index, they were using significantly less PEEP. The other thing that's from a clinical practice perspective, you have to, they did this every hour for 12 to 24 hours. So this constantly changes in your clinical practice. Would you then go to the ventilator look at the pressure uh, time curve and then change the settings every single time. And you, you know, being realistic, are you able to do that in your patients? And that's why there's many ways of applying PEEP. Is this a realistic way of applying PEEP? All right, so let's talk about recruitment maneuvers. We often hear about this. And in general, how, with a raise of hands, how often have you come across a respiratory therapist trying a recruitment maneuver? Or are you trying one yourself? Okay, all right. So. In general, recruitment maneuver is you apply a high amount of PEEP for a very short period. Some studies talk about using 30 of PEEP, 40 of PEEP for 30 to 40 seconds and then going back down, okay? Um, before actually talking about the trial, I'll go to the actual protocol of this study, which is interesting. Um, they would start at PEEP of 25. So there's two, two uh, groups. They're using um, table PEEP versus, uh, and no recruitment maneuvers versus using recruitment maneuvers. By the way, all the other studies I just mentioned earlier about PEEP, they use recruitment maneuvers sporadically in them, okay? So using PEEP at 25, every minute or two, they're going up by five, 25, 30, 35, while keeping a peak pressures of 50. So imagine the effects of that. And then titrating down, okay? Till you're able to get an ideal PEEP. And then you would just do this repeat day recruitment maneuver without titration, okay? Um, it didn't go well. So multi-centered randomized control trial, 120 ICUs, nine countries. They were able to get 1,000 moderate to severe RDS patients. And there was a significantly increased mortality at 28 days and six-month mortality. Um, not surprisingly, in the middle of the protocol, the middle of the study, they had to change the protocol because they were having too many cardiac arrests. Um, yeah. And interestingly, they never looked at RV pressures or looking at the right heart in these patients prior to doing these maneuvers. Um, but you can imagine how it would drop the cardiac output and cardiac index. Uh, you have decreased vent-free days, increased risk of pneumothorax and barotrauma, and need for vasopressors. So to really see what's driving this mortality, is it the hemodynamics or is it actually the um, recruitment that you're doing? So recruitment maneuvers are bad. Um, let's talk about paralysis. So there's two trials that I want to that I think you should know about, accuracy and ROSE. Okay, so we'll talk about this initial trial, multi-centered randomized control trial, 340 patients. 
they used cisatracurium. Uh, they used um, an initial 150 milligram bolus rapid infusion, and then 37 and a half milligrams per hour for 48 hours. Okay. Um, surprisingly, they did not use train of fours on these patients uh, when they initially did this. So there was some question, you know, they use Ramsey scores for sedation. So the question was where the patient's truly paralyzed, but um, they use Ramsey scores. Um, the, this was um, six to eight cc's per keg, peak pressures of 30. They actually used the low peep table, okay? Um, and they tried to maintain a pH between 7.2 and 7.45. Um, the outcomes were the 90-day mortality was significantly reduced. Um, there was the 28 day mortality was significantly reduced on the 90 days point of P of 0.08. Um, there were more vent free days and less bar barotrauma. One of the things that is brought up with paralysis is, is there increased myopathy and ICU weakness? So these two studies actually in their literature talk about that there wasn't, they didn't show that there was worsening weakness. Although the Rose trial, will talk a little bit more about it. There's it wasn't clear that they actually followed these patients afterwards properly to say that there was no ICU. So this initial study in paralysis shows benefit. Um, and then we go into the ROSE trial. So uh, unblind, so this was the other question. I think the first study actually said this was blinded, but can you tell if the patient's paralyzed? Are they breathing over the vent? So anyways, they said it was blinded, but the ROSE trial actually admitted this is probably unblinded, randomized controlled trial. 1,000 uh, patients use the same, um, same doses uh, of the same medication of Nimbex. And um, in this study, what they used differently was there was high amount of sedation in both groups in the first trial. In the second group, they used light sedation versus using uh, paralysis and high sedation. Okay. Um, the other thing that was different, so... The enrollment was a lot quicker. I think in the first trial, enrollment was within 16 to 24 hours. This was less than seven. On average, it was within seven hours. So patients were diagnosed and, uh, and enrolled right away. Um, and then you had your uh, 48 hours of um, paralysis. The average P to F was pretty severe, so 99. Um, they did see more ICU weakness, more cardiovascular events in patients who were on Nimbex but definitely less tra trauma and um, bare trauma and pneumothorax. So one thing you do obviously are work against uh, the pressures that you get from your chest wall, you're counteracting that. And they saw less of that in the NIMBEX group. Um, those were kind of the, there was more PEEP um, used in this trial than in uh, Acursus. But again, overall, no difference. And I think Henry Ford also enrolled in that trial here. I remember somebody coming up to me and saying, can I paralyze your patient? I said, go right ahead. If they fit the criteria. All right. <clears throat> so let's talk about paralysis. So this is a favorite topic, uh, often because people will try to ask you, can we not you know, prone this patient? And you have to justify it. Um, so there are some good questions to, uh, you know, good answers to know, A, who should be proned? Uh, how long should they be proned? When should you stop proning? Um, so 466 patients with severe RDS, P to F less than 150, they were prone for 16 hours and they kept repeating that for 28 days uh, unless they were extubated or were improving and um, coming off the criteria. So what were the criteria? Um, if your P to F gets better than 150, and of course, remember this and I always get told, oh, P to F is great, keep 16, but P to F is great. Um, so if P has to be less than or equal to 10, FIO2 less than or equal to six, and you have to demonstrate that for four, four hours post supination, okay? So just so you know, when they tell you, you don't need to prone anymore. Uh, results of the study, so significant mortality benefit at 28 days and 90 days. So the average P to F used in this group was 100. So still quite severe or in the severe category, 100 or less. Um, the interesting part was they actually used the low peak table on this study. Uh, which I thought would have been high peep. 40% uh, received steroids. Um, prone sessions on average. So I was thinking, well, how often in this study did you, if I asked you, well, how many sessions does it normally take before somebody improves? So on average, it was four sessions before they saw significant improvement that they didn't need to do any more sessions. 
Uh, at least that was the trend for plus or minus four standard deviation. And the average duration was 16 to 17 hours. So they were actually being you know, thorough about getting it done. Um, there was a higher incidence of cardiac arrest in the supine group, the one that was not prone. And I'm guessing that's from hypoxic respiratory failure, non, you know, not improving. Um, pressure sores were more pro uh, pro of a problem in your uh, proning group. And um, vent so this is actually from the study, ventilator settings could be adjusted at any time, regardless of patient position. So we often brought this, bring this up to, hey, RTs are like, it's gonna get worse. I'm not gonna touch the vent. And you could still work on the FiO2 if the patient's improving. So this is from the study. All right, let's talk about steroids. Um, so two main steroids, the earlier steroid studies to know about from 2006 and 2007. Um, one is from Steinberg, which is ArtsNet, and the other one's Maduri Protocol. And they both, despite, um, even if they were negative trials, they may actually give you something. So first one, uh, randomized control trial, 180 patients. Um, they both have different steroid timing and the dose of steroids. So the first one uh, gave IV methylpred two mg per kg, then 0.5 mg per kg per body weight, uh, and then tapered it over a month um, or even longer. And one of the main things they got, despite the fact that no mortality benefit, they actually noticed those patients that received it after 14 days of ARDS had worsened mortality, okay? So if one thing you do know, you're not gonna use steroids in um, early, uh, late ARDS. Uh, in the second trial, uh, also double-blind, uh, multi-centered randomized control trial, 91 patients. So they used a dose of, um, so the Maduri protocol was IV methylpred, one mg per kg per day versus placebo for 28 days. Um, and this was an early ARDS, so within 72 hours, okay? Uh, they did use cosentropin test, uh, stim test for the study. Um, they did use a loading, uh, one mg per kg day one through 14, then 0.5 for the next seven days, and then 0.25 for the seven days after that. Um, there was no, so one of the interesting parts is there was no increased infections. Um, they actually calculate how much it would cost, so it would cost $240 for the whole, whole course of the treatment. Again, it's steroids. Steroids were never expensive. Um, but, you know, uh, you do see reduction in lung injury scores. Um, and um, uh, there was a steroids increased uh, breathing without assistance, um, lower uh, organ dysfunction, so on and so forth. And then I think this is an interesting study to talk about, which is a lot, you know, more from last year. It's recent, 17 teaching ICUs in Spain, moderate to severe ARDS. Um, this was P to F of about 142. Uh, average PEEP used was about 12.6. So this was dexamethasone. They didn't even give it past 10 days. So they knew that you can't give it late ARDS. So they did 20 milligrams for the first five days and then 10 milligrams for the following five days. Again, no COVID. Uh, I know we don't even run into ARDS non-COVID anymore, but... Um, if you do, this, this study actually showed a decreased mortality at 60 days, increased vent free days, and no increased adverse events. So this whole aspect of paralysis causing more weakness or steroids actually causing increased um, infections, I don't know, at least uh, from evidence standpoint, I don't know if you've seen that in these large trials. Um, dexamethasone is uh, more potent anti-inflammatory uh, versus mineralocorticoids, maybe 20 to 30 times more potent than cortisol um, and prednisone. It does have a longer half-life compared to uh, methylpred. So maybe that's also playing a role. Um, the trial was stopped early at 88% due to low enrollment. All right, let's talk about fluid management. So we talked about the FACT trial earlier. Um, this is the same study, except they also published uh, the data on how a conservative fluid strategy versus liberal, okay? And I'll show you their protocol. It makes your head spin first. Uh, this is what they use, but to make it easier, they're trying to see, A, are you in shock? So first of all, if you tip it out to CVP versus PO, uh, pulmonary artery catheter, they're trying to see, are you in shock? Are you in oliguric? And do you have effective circulation? which you can, you don't have to get cardiac index or output modeling and things like that. So, but those are the three main things. 
75% of the population in the fact trial actually fit the last three where they did not have shock, they didn't, weren't oligaric, and they had effective circulation, okay? So most people end up in those last five boxes. But in general, this is the protocol they used. And this was the actual outcome. So no difference in 60-day mortality, but definitely improved lung function, decreased vent days, IC length of stay, and actually did not increase shock or dialysis. So that was one important aspect, right? We oftentimes have tons of food bags hanging on our patients in the ICU. And at the very least, they're required to be uvolemic, if not actually diuresis further. And they didn't have increased uh, renal failure or, shock, uh, or dialysis in these patients. Correct, yep. So they would use, um, I believe they did use Lasix. Yep, furosemide. All right, um, high frequency oscillation. Has anyone seen the machine before? In person, of course. Have you guys seen it? <laughs> so um, this is uh, just in theory and in how it affects the lungs. So they will use Hertz uh, as a frequency of how much of a respiratory rate you have. So we're talking three to 15 Hertz uh, which ends up being 180 breaths to 900 breaths per minute. Now, that's a significant amount of air movement where you don't, the th in theory, less atelectasis, so you don't even have time to collapse at the alveoli. You maintain um, lower pressures, okay? And you don't end up giving significant tidal volume. So in theory, it sounds great. And they actually use this in animals. Uh, they did say in the animal models, they created ARDS by giving saline lavages, and I don't know how much that applies to real ARDS in humans, um, but this is, uh, these are the two studies you should know about, Oscar and Oscillate, okay? So Oscar, they were both published at the same time in New England Journal of Medicine, um, multi-centered randomized controlled trial, 795 patients, PDF less than 200, uh, high-frequency oscillation versus usual. They both, both, so this is a separate ventilator, uh, they used different ventilators. They used different I to E ratios because the first one's one to one, the second one was one to two. Um, and you can imagine these uh, using, breathing in this way requires a lot of sedation. It's not the most comfortable. It's not, it doesn't feel natural. Um, but, you know, the first study didn't show any 30, uh, difference in 30 day mortality. The reason you don't see it anymore is because in the second uh, oscillate trial, it showed an increase in, in hospital mortality. Okay, um, so uh, they saw a significantly higher sedation, higher neuromuscular blockade, so you're having to paralyze these patients. Um, and it is still used in neonates. Uh, I actually went for an interview somewhere and they were really proudly showing me their high frequency oscillations. I was like, I haven't seen it and I don't know why you have it. We, sh we shouldn't be, here it is. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, so let's talk about ECMO. Um, two, two trials to know about. One is much earlier, one's more recent. So uh, Caesar and Aeolia. Uh, so Caesar trial, uh, 22 treatment centers. They actually, so the, they were trying to look for how does uh, ECMO benefit in um, ARDS? But I think what they ended up studying here is the difference between a tertiary care center that provides ECMO type care versus not using it versus being, where are you transferring patients from, okay? Um, so your triage calls. Um, so the things that we're looking at, uh, P to F score, chest X-ray quadrants, PEEP and compliance, um, they were also looking at, um, so the patients they enrolled were severe, um, air, uh, acute respiratory failure, MERS score greater than three, hypercapnia, um, where they really weren't ventilating. Um, 61% of these were pneumonia, ARDS, and 29%. Uh, this is, again, during the H1N1 um, epidemic. The weaknesses of these trial, again, so it's not really showing ECMO, but actually ECMO centers. 93% uh, in the intervention group versus 70% in the control group uh, were treated with lung ventilation strategy. So that's kind of, there's a big difference there. Um, Proning was the same, but it was only done in 30% of patients. You would think you would want to prone more before you say that you don't need this. Steroids were used 84% versus 64%. Uh, 
And then they even use high frequency oscillation, 7% versus 14%. But uh, this is from 2009, so it's okay. Um, uh, with the primary outco outcomes being death or disability. So while they did see a survival benefit, there were a number of patients that were put uh, in the ECMO category, but never needed ECMO. So when you get these triage calls and they say, this patient has respiratory failure, they need ECMO and they look terrible and they're on people like eight when they come to you and you're saying, just send the patient to me and then you find out most of the time you can optimize them and you don't need ECMO. Um, all right, so this was the CESA trial. So let's talk about Aeolia. This was um, published in 2018, New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, 2,249 um, patients, severe ARDS and the criteria tell you how severe it is. So PDF less than 50, uh, most trials we've looked at here are between 99 to 130 to 140 in severe, uh, moderate to severe RDS. So PDF less than 50 for three hours, PDF less than 80 for six hours. Um, they're really not ventilating anymore. Their pH is less than 7.25 with CO2s that are greater than 60 for six hours. So that was the criteria used. Immediate BV ECMO versus conventional management. Um, this study was actually stopped early for futility, despite the fact that there was actually a trend towards benefit in the ECMO group. 28% um, of control patients crossed over to the ECMO side uh, for refractory hypoxemia. And then you actually see that their mortality, the crossover patients was 57%, that's much higher. Um, so the mortality in the, um, in the control group is 46%, that's what you expect, but that's a quite a mortality benefit. And I don't know if patients have a really poor chance that they were just excluded. And that's why you see a significant mortality benefit. Um, they use PEEP per the express trial that I mentioned. So a lot of uh, higher PEEP. Uh, neuromuscular blockade, um, prostacyclines, nitric oxide, work, recruitment maneuvers, all that was used if needed for refractory hypoxemia. Um, before randomization, they had 59% that were proning. As you see more, you know, more recent studies, we're doing the things we're supposed to do more often. So 59% are being proned, 74% uh, required pressors. Uh, in the control group, 90% are being prone. Of course, you don't have ECMO and there's not a lot to do. You at least do the things you do have. Um, average P to F was uh, 73 in the non-prone group. I mean, non-ECMO uh, group. Um, so again, but it did show benefit. All right. Oxygenation goals. So we often talk about anytime anybody asks you, well, what's your PO2 goal? We talk about 55 to 80 from the ARDSNET trials. But this was a study, uh, LOCO2 trial, multi centered, um, random, uh, randomized controlled trial where they used 205 patients in uh, French ICUs. And they were able to find that in the more liberal strategy, so again, 55 to 70 versus 90 to 105. There's no difference in 28 day mortality. You do see a trend to benefit. Um, and there was uh, five episodes of mesenteric ischemia that was seen. The interesting part was, at least for me, where the people that had the highest mortality were PAO2 is less than 67. The lowest mortality was between 87 to 93, okay? I'm also on that side where I try to use the least amount of PO2 to keep weaning the ventilator because I want them to come off the ventilator. But I think there's probably a balance to be had here where we are not just being super conservative. They're pretty hypoxic and we're weaning aggressively because um, that also has, um, you, you, you hurt the patient when you keep them on too long with high PO2s. You also hurt the patient where you're being way too conservative. So I think we have to find a balance specifically to our patients. Um, all right, those were the kind of the main trials I wanted to talk about there. All these other trials, the hint is a lot of these were negative trials. But there are all these other trials done in um, ARDS, uh, if you want to read about them. Uh, I, before we end, I do want to talk about the lung stave study. So international multi-centered prospective cohort study. It's very impressive how many um, centers were used, 469 in 50 countries, five continents, quite an effort. And they had 29,000 patients, of which 10% were ARDS. Uh, the interesting part was, so they had clinicians actually um, looking at the charts and their x-rays to assess who had ARDS. Clinician recognition of ARDS in this large uh, prospective study was 60%. Um, they actually were seeing who would diagnose early versus late, and 36% were diagnosed quite late. Um, 
they two thirds received tidal volumes less than eight. Okay, so again, we can't, we're not doing tidal volumes, right? Uh, plateau pressure was only checking 40% of patients. Uh, PEEP less than 12 and 80% of patients. Proning was done in 16% of patients that actually have severe ARDS. So, um, and these were actually the mortality of these uh, patients. And I think this kind of summarizes ni nicely that, you know, it's under-recognized, it's under-treated, and you have significant mortality and you have a lot of room for, you know, improvement. So, so kind of my take home points. Um, but at the end of the day, try to individualize therapy to your patients. Okay, these are my references. Thank you. Any questions? That is our huh? Yeah, I did not pay attention. No, it's in the end. That was awesome. All right, cool. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I go over the, I went over, but you're perfect. Oh. All right. Good.